presentation is a panel to sort of close out this section on consumer goods and fashion and jewelry. And I'm excited to bring Kelly McCarroll uh, Gilbert to the stage from Carbon. Kelly is a business development director on Carbon's application development team. And her focus to date has been on foam replacement, working to replace foam with variable density lattice parts. And we're also going to be bringing to the stage uh, Emma Boucher and Gaia Galati, and I will let them uh, tell you a little bit more about themselves. But Kelly, uh, welcome to the stage and thanks for hosting this panel. Thanks, Melanie. Um, are Emma and Gaia on as well? Uh, bringing them up now, it'll just take a second. You can go ahead and uh, introduce the panel if you'd like, Kelly. Yeah, um, so thanks for the introduction, Melanie. Uh, as Melanie mentioned, I am a business development director on our application development team. So working very closely with companies like Specialized to help uh, incorporate Carbon's technology to create these high-performing products. Um, today we'll be speaking about how um, a couple of different people have used um, 3D printing and additive manufacturing to create these high, high volume and high performing products uh, and bring them to market at scale. Um, before we dive into questions, um, I will let Gaia and Emma introduce themselves. Um, throughout this presentation, please feel free to put questions in the chat and I will do my best to incorporate them and, and leave some time for questions at the end. Gaia, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm Gaia Gilotti. I'm the co-founder and chief creative of Hylos. So um, Hylos is a footwear tech platform. We're reimagining the way shoes are made with 3D printing. Um, so we make everything to order using on-demand production. And we also uh, make everything recyclable. So all the shoes that we produce are designed to be disassembled at recyc and recycled at the end of their lives. And that is all thanks to 3D printing. Thank you. Emma, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Boucher. I am the product manager for saddles, grips, and tape at Specialized Bicycle Components. Uh, we are headquartered out of Morgan Hill, California. I, however, am based out of our Boulder office. Um, I've been working with Specialized for almost two years now, kind of starting in more of an engineering type role and now moving into product management. Um, but kind of my focus today and what were my product of interest today is uh, bike seats or bike saddles. Um, so really excited to show you what we've been working on, kind of where we came from and how we've been using 3D printing to, to really reimagine um, some of our most popular product. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you both for joining. Um, I'm going to get started with a couple of questions. Um, maybe starting with Gaia, and would love to hear from both of you. Um, very easy question. Why additive manufacturing? What inspired you to get started in this space? Uh, what have you learned along the way? What are, what are some of the key benefits that you've seen as you started this product development cycle? Yeah, so um, for me personally, I've always been super intrigued by 3D printing uh, since I was in college um, when I first heard about it. And so with Hylos, Hylos was actually inspired by 3D printing. Um, we have used it from the conception and um, the way that we're using it is to reimagine the way shoes are made. Um, and we kind of do the parts. So one is more of the environmental piece. Um, the other is more of the performance piece. So um, the footwear industry and the fashion industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world. And so we, uh, me and my co-founder Elias, uh, discovered that with 3D printing, there's ways to really mitigate that. Um, 24 billion shoes are made every year and one out of five of those goes straight to the landfill. And that's because of overproduction. Um, the way that the industry works right now is that buyers have to predict what customers are going to buy um, 18 months from now. Um, and so the way that we can make shoes using 3D printing, um, we're actually able to make after customer orders. And that lessens um, the, the need to predict. Um, and it takes away that one out of five pairs that has to go straight into the landfill because it wasn't accounted for. Um, so one is uh, environmental. And then the second is performance. 
um, we're able to use geometries, um, use CAD in order to completely enhance and recreate the way that shoes are made. Um, right now, the traditional way of making shoes is to glue a bunch of layers of different materials together, like foam, um, nylon, uh, leather, uh, things like that, that um, when they get glued together, it's pretty much impossible to take them apart cleanly and recycle those components. And so using geometries, we're able to design ways of assembling shoes that can be taken apart, recycled, um, as, as well as use geometries to enhance the, the performance and the comfort of the shoe itself. Um, where we put a lattice structure on the top of our footbed uh, to make it super comfortable, completely different feel than any other, other shoe out there. We really couldn't do any of these things without uh, this technology. Great. And, and do you see, uh, just kind of hitting on your first comment, do you see this starting to pick up more steam in the fashion industry, kind of focused on that sustainability aspect? Is this see, I know we have a bunch of different speakers in the fashion kind of world on this panel and, and in this presentation today, but what is your view on how this is kind of changing the way people make products? Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the fact that there's a lot of fashion speakers um, at Type this year because it really is making waves in the fashion space and in the footwear space. Um, you know, I've been hearing recently a lot of a lot of others think the same way where 3D printing, it's it's not if but when it's going to take over the footwear space. It really is uniquely positioned for footwear um, in the way that you can in the way that uh, the technology is currently developed, the materials that are currently developed, um, it's really well positioned to enhance um, the performance of footwear. I think when it comes to apparel, um, materials and post-processing really need to be developed further. Uh, we need softer materials, more flexible um, materials that feel good on your skin um, and different post-processing materials or post-processing methods that um, are a little bit more flexible to color and pattern um, and things that uh, just a little bit more, I guess, designer friendly, uh, if that's a good way. Um, but I, I can definitely see the industry going in that direction. Um, we're already developing all of those things. And so once we do get there, I think it's going to take over the fashion space as well, the, the apparel. That's great. That that is great to hear, and and I, I will keep picking your brain a little bit on on some of some of the comments you made. But um, want to kind of hear the same perspective from Emma, who also working in consumer goods, but uh, completely different focus outside of fashion and and focused on the saddle space. So, Emma, why saddles? Why additive manufacturing? What was what was the thought process behind that, and what was it that you set out to create? Yeah, so for, for those of you on the call who are uh, avid bike riders or have ridden a bike before, I'm sure when you hear seat bike saddle, comfort is not a word that comes to mind at all. Um, so bikes and bikes, the riding experience sitting on a saddle um, has uh, is is uncomfortable. Um, and so for the longest time, we've been making bike saddles out of traditional PU foam um which has kind of its its limitations so uh specializes uh really core to our dna is innovation and pushing technology um not just for the sake of pushing technology but to um, really provide a a benefit for our riders and to improve the riding experience um and so i think saddles was really a, a perfect place to to start because uh because it is uncomfortable um, so, like I said, we use traditional PU foam for, for the longest time and then uh, kind of a few years ago started experimenting with different types of foam. Um, we launched a saddle, uh, if you're familiar with uh, our Mimic line, Mimic technology meaning to mimic women's soft tissue. So, we took traditional uh, cutout foam saddles and just kind of just started chopping away at them and experimenting with different types of foam uh, on the nose of the saddle. So where your soft tissue is in contact with the bike saddle uh, meant to mimic women's soft tissue. So uh, we experimented with different types of memory foam. This has a, a cutout as you see here. Um, this prototype here has kind of a memory foam in the cutout. So kind of a supportive cutout we'd, we'd call it. Um, 
And so that was us using foam uh, as much as we could to, to make the riding experience more comfortable. Uh, these saddles are incredibly, incredibly popular among women and men. Um, but that was, we found that that was really the extent that we could push foam, this kind of multi-density, multi-layer foam stacked on top of each other. Um, that was really, that was really the extent of what we were able to achieve. So with 3D printing, um, that was a perfect opportunity to really uh, reimagine how uh, a, a saddle is manufactured and also uh, what kind of comfort it can provide. So uh, we acquired a, a carbon 3D printer, I think at least five years ago, and I was an intern then and was experimenting with different lattice geometries, uh, printing elastic polyurethane, uh, kind of puck samples, and then all the way to 3D printing um, what would be a replacement for uh, traditional foam. So now we have a fully 3D printed upper. Um, that's probably the extent of what I'll go into now. But yeah, just a uh, perfect opportunity to improve the riding experience through 3D printing. Yeah, thank you. And, and I love that you have some visuals for everyone, everyone to get to see. Yeah. Um, that's actually a really good segue. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the design process. And we're getting a handful of questions already in the chat asking the same questions. Um, and maybe Emma, to kind of elaborate on what you were discussing, how did you go about creating this product? How did you, uh, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, the difference in qualitative and quantitative feedback and how each element was important. Uh, what were you out trying to solve for and what type of data and testing were you doing to kind of make sure that you were actively tracking to a really high performing product. So um, I guess I'll just kind of pick up the saddle to, to show. So um, this is the first 3D printed saddle that we launched. It's the Power S-Works Power Saddle with Mirror Technology. Uh, kind of hard to see, but underneath there is a multi-density, varying density lattice. Um, kind of, as I said, with foam, we were able to kind of have a few different zones of um, memory foam and, and firm foam, uh, able to really manipulate the density of foam in a single part. And we're able to do that with 3D printing. So um, underneath, we kind of have uh, a firmer density. Uh, if you were able to feel it through the screen, but it's a firmer density where um, kind of where your uh, pelvis, your sit bones are really going to be planted on the saddle. Uh, meant to support you, and then softer, similar to the Mimic saddles, uh, softer in the nose. So uh, working with the teams at Carbon, we're able to uh, use data, use uh, measurements of, uh, I guess, lattice parameters to manipulate what that means for ride feel. So Carbon can provide those uh, stiffness parameters, and then we're able to uh, we're able to ride test these saddles and get qualitative feedback, um, and 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 are, and are able to iterate from there. So there's a, a qualitative aspect in terms of um, riders who are familiar with our saddles. They're able to kind of give us a thumbs up, thumbs down, and elaborate on what they're feeling. Um, but then we're also able to use pressure mapping to really confirm. Um, and validate the work that we're doing as well. So we're not just having someone saying, yeah, I think this feels better. Like we're actually able to see um, that pressure is mitigated using a lattice structure versus a traditional PU foam. Um, so it's really kind of this back and forth and iterate, try and uh, test and, and ride test and get out on the bike. Um, we're able to do that many, many times and, and ultimately get to a saddle where uh, we Kind of we we know that we've hit the right uh the right balance of um supportive and um kind of compliant saddle so uh yeah is that good sufficient yeah. answer i'd say it's a lot of data uh that we can <laughs> not only inform the design but then also validate what we're doing i'm curious about yeah. something emma yeah um, go ahead so because this reminds me a lot of our testing as we do wear testing you guys do ride testing um, so we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit and it's been a little bit of trial and error on who we test with mm -hmm. because there's, uh, for you guys, you have professional writers and you have amateur writers, right? Mm -hmm. And we have the same thing where we have, um, your day-to-day -day person that may not know much about footwear other than the fact that she's walked in shoes her whole life. 
and you have uh, the footwear expert um, and designer, which we have plenty of in Portland, which is nice. Um, and they give very uh, comprehensive feedback, but they're not necessarily our customer. So I'm mm -hmm. curious, how, what do you, what's your guys' process in choosing your writers? Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really good question. Uh, so we have custom, we customers, we support professional athletes, professional road mountain bike uh, sponsored athletes who ride specialized bikes and therefore specialized saddles. So um, they're not buying our product, but we do have to make sure that we're supporting them through the Tour de France or some extensive period of time that they're going to be on the bike. So um, we, uh, we go over to Europe a few times a year and actually get our product in front of new product in front of our athletes, um, and get feedback from them, knowing that they are a very unique use case. They can definitely provide like the longevity feedback because they're going to be putting so many hours on the bike. Um, but we know that their riding position and kind of everything about their riding profile is not representative of your everyday rider. Um, so we really make sure that we incorporate both and have, as I said, I'm in Boulder, Colorado, which is actually a huge cycling hub in the U S. So we have kind of professional riders here and amateur riders here, and then, uh, everyday riders as well. So depending, depending on the, the saddle that we need testing on, we really tailor our product testing and feedback, knowing that one group is not going to be, uh, representative or we can't extrapolate that to, to all other groups. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting balance of trying to, um, I guess, meet the needs of a lot of different types of riders. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Gaia, I may, I may turn it back to you to answer the same question. I mean, I, Emma talked us through a bunch of how she went about product design, how you take all of this data and, and essentially use it to create something that can be tested and that can be where we can iterate and incorporate this feedback. Um, it sounds like totally different product, but very similar process. So working with both amateur users and uh, the equivalent of professor footwear experts, um, would love to hear about your design process. What did that look like? How did it, what did it look like for your first product? How has it continued to evolve? Um, would love to spend a little bit of time there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, so I'll start by saying that we are a very small company. We're not specialized and we're a startup and don't have the kind of budget to um, to kind of get that data uh, feed loop and the pressure mapping um, quite yet. So for us, it's a little bit more down and dirty. Um, and uh, and the other part of it is that we're we're completely um, we're making shoes in a completely new way. Um, and so every every shoe, every new um, design that we put out is, um, is something that's completely new. And, um, anyways, there was a point to that and I forgot, but I'll, I'll tell you the, <laughs> I'll tell you the, the process is that, um, uh, that we essentially, we start with, um, doing research. Um, we start with researching, um, different ways of construction, footwear construction, um, new ways, old ways. Um, the, we actually came to our first footwear construction, which is called string lasting, which is, um, our first product to market, the Georgia, um, that has, um, it's the leather comes together with the platform, which this piece is actually 3d printed. It looks like wood, but, um, but it's hydro dipped to look like wood. The inside actually looks like this. This is a different model, but um, this is the 3D printed piece before it's post-processed. So, um, so this is called string lasting and the leather comes together with the platform using this cable right here. Um, and so this is a super ancient form of shoemaking that we kind of brought back and uh, renewed for 3D printing. So in the ancient form, there's many layers involved in this, but it's the same idea that a cable comes together and puts the shoe together. Um, with our form, uh, it's just one single piece that everything comes into the channels. And we were able to use 3D printing and CAD design to kind of create this architecture underneath. Um, so that's one example of like us looking back at 
different ways of footwear constructions. And that's kind of usually where we start. Um, from there, uh, one of my favorite parts, we get to go shopping. We get to go look at different um, trends and designs that are out there. I know it's a, it's like a funny thing that we do, um, but we get to go uh, shop around, look for inspiration, um, buy shoes that we're really into and, um, and take what we like, leave what we don't. Um, and then, um, and then we start sketching. Um, so, uh, we sketch up a bunch of ideas. We kind of narrow it down and, um, going back to my point of like us being a completely new, uh, footwear company, everything we make is a new development. We are limited to just one development or like one to two, and then we narrow it down to one. Um, in the footwear and fashion space, usually what happens is an entire collection is developed, designed and developed, and like half of it gets thrown, gets tossed, and the other half goes to stores or gets sold. Um, so we're really limited because it's a new development. Um, but yeah, so once it's sketched up, we go through a tech packing process um, where we get into the technical details, uh, we measure out um, the different widths and, um, and dimensions that we want to spec out. And then we have a 3D CAD designer who is super talented and throws it together in CAD form and um, we put it into, in the printer. Um, and so we then, you know, have a few iterations. We're able, the nice thing about 3D printing too is like we're able to see um, prototypes so quickly. Um, we're, we're able to iterate on them, in them on them uh, so quickly. Um, so usually the development process in footwear or in fashion is about 18 months from concept to in-store um, or online. Um, with high lows, we've actually been able to shrink that to about three months and we're aiming to shrink it down even more um, because of how quickly you can do those iterations. So in between those iterations, that's where we do the wear testing. Um, and so we do a couple of phases of wear testing where we have just uh, the first sample size, which we sample it off of a size eight because that's my shoe size. And we have a lot of size eight uh, people in our office. So it's convenient. We get to test it around the office, um, make sure it's up to our standard. And then um, once that the sniff test, we um, do we go through a process called grading, which means, you know, uh, taking from that sample size and grading out our other sizes from uh, six to 12 or whatever that may be. Um, and then we, uh, and then we put it through uh, the sniff test of like outside people. So that has been in the past people that are in the footwear space and really know their stuff and know what to look for. And also has just been, um, you know, a, fr a friend of mine who um, doesn't really know much about 3D printing or footwear but she would be like a customer, you know, that would find us randomly. Um, so then, uh, so once that kind of gets approved, um, we can go into production essentially. That's really helpful and in such an interesting space. I think I need to become a footwear tester myself. It sounds like you get access to some pretty cool shoes. Done. Um, we, we are getting a lot of questions in the chat about customization and what, if any, plans you have towards making these fully custom. I know you've talked a lot about the different sizes, and I know they're not custom today, but is that something that um, you've thought about or something that a lot of times people hear 3D printing and I think, and, and probably same goes for the saddle, they think, oh, great, this is going to be very personalized to me. Um, is that something you've spent any time thinking about or something that you kind of see in the future of the fashion industry and additive manufacturing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of space for customization in the 3D printing world and in the footwear world. Um, and we actually started off wanting to be a lot more custom than where we are right now. Um, and we kind of scaled that back a little bit after um, a lot of research, essentially. So um, for one, scanning, foot scanning, um, it's a really high touch point. So you're going to get a really niche audience that's actually going to do that. Um, we did a lot of testing around foot scanning apps too, that is a little bit more feasible for a customer to do at home. Um, and they just don't have the right accuracy for, for what we need with footwear. Every millimeter really does count. 
And so it's really hard to get accuracy there, especially with user error. Um, you know, you're not a professional scanner. Uh, not, not a lot of people are. So it's really hard to get accurate data um, for, for scanning your foot. Um, and our, we kind of, we really had to take a, take a look at what we wanted, right? Cause that was the customization was a huge part of what we wanted to bring to the table because it's such a big part of what 3d printing is. But at the same time, our, our goal was to commercialize 3d printing. Like we wanted 3d printing to be at the forefront. We wanted, uh, your regular Joe Schmo to know what 3d printing was and understand the benefits of 3D printing, you know, and like that meant going a little bit more uh, like uh, going towards like the customer experience that is that people are used to, um, which is, you know, choosing from a standard set of sizes. And so we decided to just lengthen that standard, that, that set of sizes because, uh, because we can make on demand it's a lot easier to offer more sizes. You don't have to buy into all those sizes. Um, and use the benefit of 3D printing in many other ways. Um, so we have veered away from custom, um, but I will say there, there's a space for it. And um, I have a little anecdote, um, but what, one of the first people that we met coming to Portland and something to know about me and my co-founder is that we, we, didn't, we weren't in the footwear space before. I was in fashion, he was in software. Um, so we were like, somewhat there, but we were new to footwear completely. And so we had to do a lot of research. We met a lot of people who knew what they were doing in footwear within Portland. And so one of those people, um, Bill Crary, he owns Crary Shoes. Um, he's been around for many, many years and he does super customized footwear um, for people that have um, uh, disabilities and different, um, different kind of foot conditions that would never be able to fit into a standard shoe, which I think is amazing. Um, but the, the shapes of the shoes and the, the um, sizes of the shoes that we saw in his factory were like something that we'd never seen before. And so he's been using um, traditional manufacturing for his entire career. And when we came to him and told him about our idea of um, completely changing the way that shoes are made, this was before we had done anything. Um, we were just researching and told him that we were going to use 3D printing to do this. He literally laughed in our faces. He let us use his foot <laughs> scanner. That's like one of the reasons we came to him because we heard he has this foot scanner. He let us use the foot scanner um, and he sent us off on, on our way. And so, you know, we didn't really talk to him for a while after that. And um, for, for uh, I think we ended up coming back to him for, um, we knew he had like a bunch of machinery that we wanted to test and bring to our facility. And so we, we got back there and, and we showed him the shoes that we made. And he was like really, really impressed. And he actually, um, that actually inspired him to start using 3D printing too, which he's like a 70 year old, uh, maybe more than that, like guy. And he's like, he really became an expert on 3D printing um, after like seeing that what, what we were able to do with it. So um, so yeah, there, there is definitely space for customization in footwear and 3D printing. Um, it's not somewhere we are right now, but, um, but I, I do think that there is room for that within, um, within our company. And I think we just need to grow a little bit more, um, in order to be able to kind of, uh, serve that wider customer range. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that's a really good anecdote and a really good story because, um, a lot of what. 3D printing is bringing to the table is this aspect of personalization and customization that people aren't familiar with. People didn't realize was possible. And, and a step in that direction is having, to your point, more shoe sizes and more options for customers and, and for consumers, and then kind of continuing to grow into more and more custom aspects. And we're seeing that across a lot of different industries. Um, I think this is a good segue. And actually, a really interesting part of your story is how do you go about teaching customers what it is you're creating? Like what, what is the product feedback you're receiving in the market? What is it that a lot of people will buy things because they hear they're 3d printed, but they don't actually know what that means. Others won't buy them because they don't know what that means. It's a very kind of fine line of 
we're trying to teach more and more people about this industry and this technology. How do you go about marketing these and, and teaching the consumer what it is that they're what it is that they're kind of seeing in terms of improvements as compared to traditional manufacturing? And what is the market? How has the market reacted? I'd love to hear that from both sides, uh, both from the footwear industry and the saddle side of things. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's not easy. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, with you know the the way that we've designed our shoes, they look like regular shoes. You know, there's nothing that stands out when you look at it. What um, that tells you that it's something unique, um, which is very purposeful. Um, but it does make it really hard to educate the customer because so many times, um, be, like we've really tricked them into thinking that it's wood, um, you know, and not, not on purpose, but, um, but it just looks like wood. And, you know, even it's funny, like, this is kind of crazy, but even my mom, um, was like, wait, this isn't wood. And she's <laughs> obviously been along this journey. Um, but you know, by the time that we got the product out there, she was looking at it and she like really was shocked. So, um, so I think it's, it's kind of, uh, it's hard to, um, like visually show. And so a big part of that is, um, storytelling and talking about the way that we're, um, trying to conserve the environment, um, while also introducing this completely new, um, uh, new performance, uh, which I actually, I don't know if I've gotten the chance to show you guys, but um, this is the lattice structure that's underneath um, the leather footbed. So this is really squishy and soft and the platform itself is very flexible. And so um, this is kind of our best tool in teaching our customers and our audience what it really is. So we try to come up with unique pieces of content to really show off the 3D printed platform um, and show off that digital mesh in a way that's you know, still appealing to the end user um, and still showing off the style of the shoe since that's really important to the purchase. Obviously, you need to like the shoe. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but I have to say that the response has been really positive. Um, people are really impressed by the technology and by the recyclability. Um, of it. And it's something that they are inspired to like have for themselves so that they can continue telling that story too. Like it's a, it's a unique piece for their own story of like their journey on sustainability. So overall the response has been positive and confused. <laughs> that is fair. I think people, people will stay that way. And, and I, I love seeing the different ways. I spent quite a bit of time on your website after you and I spoke last week and reading some of the consumer reviews. And, and I think it's, you've done a fantastic job at helping customers understand what is the true benefits of something like this? What sets this apart from, you know, a standard shoe item that you would typically buy? So um, I think that's great. I definitely want to circle back and come back to the sustainability aspect. But um, I'd love to hear from Emma kind of same thing. How are, how are riders reacting to this? Are you hearing different things from your average user as compared to your pre professional teams? Um, what is, what is kind of the chatter in the market and how are people receiving this? Yeah. So uh, I guess kind of unlike Helos, uh, our product really markets itself. It really does look different. Um, and I would also kind of, uh, agree with the, the confused aspect as well. It's almost this like puzzlement, like it looks cool. I don't really know what it is. Um, that's kind of the, the first impression, but it does look different from a traditional saddle. And that's really what draws people in, um, in terms of feedback, um, it is without a doubt, uh, the mirror line. So it's launched, I said, in the this kind of short nose power saddle. Um, very recently, we launched our second model, which is a more uh, traditional long nose saddle. Um, so now with two, two saddles that are um, out in the market and out on bikes, uh, the feedback has been outstanding, um, both from uh, riders, from news sources, from our professional riders. Uh, it's really amazing to also just get those emails of people saying, hey, I've been um, 
telling me their stories of how they've been able to ride longer or how they had to stop riding. Um, but the saddle now allows them to ride their bike again. Um, it's really amazing to hear how this product has had an influence on riders of all, of all abilities. Um, some of the, I had highlighted some of these before some, uh, from the news sources about, uh, kind of their feedback on the saddle. Um, one row, it almost feels like you're hovering over the saddle rather than sitting on it. Um, another one said, it makes my butt so happy if I could twerk, which I can't. It would twerk in the streets and unbridled, uncontrollable happiness. Um, those are reviews coming from uh, from cycling news sources for people who have tested all types of saddles, been riding bikes forever. Um, and this is the kind of feedback they're having. Um, on the professional front, uh, our professional riders, in the way that they're not always the best product testers, um, they're very hesitant to change. Um, their bike fit, their bike setup is super, super important. And once they find something that works, you really don't want to change it. Um, and any small change can be, can result in a big, uh, performance comfort, uh, difference for them. So to get a rider to change a saddle is a huge task. Um, and I really don't know how, how we did it, but, uh, I was over working with the teams, uh, I guess, January of last year. Um, the mirror saddles were still a bit new and uh, we had a few riders on it, but um, not, not a ton. Um, now seeing pictures from some of my teammates who have gone over and worked with the riders again this year, I'm, they're sending me photos of all the bikes lined up and you just have a mirror saddle on every other bike. Um, and that's incredible, again, for riders who are super particular, super hesitant to change, uh, to see so many of them riding this product is, is amazing. And uh, likewise, I've heard from those riders of how it's made um, their experience so much more pleasant on the bike. Um, so yeah, it's been incredibly positive. And um, I guess the it almost just makes it hard to improve upon because we are looking for ways to to push the technology and um uh finding other places to implement it so it's really um really important that we're getting feedback so we're able to um improve upon and um launch even better product going forward yeah i think that's great and and i remember uh, from when you and I spoke, even a couple of months back, you shared a quote with me that uh, somebody responded that this saddle is so great because they can't actually feel it under them. And it, it goes hand in hand with you. You want people to know what the technology is, but in something like a saddle or footwear, you want it to be so comfortable that you don't actually realize that you're using it or sitting on it. You don't have these pressure points. You don't have these blisters. You don't have all of these factors that you only notice if they're bad. And so I thought that was a really interesting quote to say, you know, I love this so much because I don't notice that I'm sitting on it, um, which is, is just really cool to what you guys have accomplished with this saddle. Um, I'll put you on the spot for a minute. Uh, you mentioned other products, other things, and, and exploring how else to use this technology. Where where do you see this going next? What, what have you been asked about? Are there requests you've seen from users or riders at touch points of the saddle or um, other touch points on the bikes that you you would be interested in exploring? Yeah, so saddles, um, we have a, a fairly extensive lineup of different shapes and width saddles. So um, we have it in in two saddles and we're finding ways to bring it to, to more shapes, to more riders. Um, in terms of other touch points, uh, that kind of goes a little bit beyond my uh, 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 my role and my like product focus, but um, the saddle is one of the the main touch points on the bike. So you have uh, your feet, your hands, and your butt, um, and those I think are the um, I think the most exciting spaces to to innovate in um, uh, because of that because of that human interaction and how you're able to take um, traditional um, manufacturing processes and materials um, and improve upon it to improve the riding experience uh, as a whole. Um, so I know I know for sure that there are, um, I guess, other groups within Specialized are, are really more in the B2B 
beginning stages, more of the exploratory phases, trying to see uh, whether there's actually a, a rider benefit or not. So uh, Saddles has definitely kind of paved the way in terms of um, exploring and then validating and now commercializing. Uh, I think it's just as we see the product out in the market and keep hearing uh, that feedback will just probably reinforce even more uh, for other teams that it's for sure a big uh, time investment and uh, unknown area to dive into, but the um, the payoff is really is really there. Yeah, that's great to hear and, and, and love to hear that other potential possibilities and just being able to really take what you've learned from saddles and, and get all this great feedback and figure out what comes next. So um, really, really fun to see how these saddles are being reviewed in the markets. I know we are probably halfway through all the questions that I'm getting, not even, and we only have a couple minutes left. Um, I do, Gaia, we're getting a lot of questions about durability and the sustainability aspect. Um, I would love, I know you talked a lot about how you're combining different elements, you're creating these more sustainable parts and really using additive manufacturing, uh, not just to tackle the comfort and performance element, to, to focus on creating something that's more sustainable and ultimately more durable. Um, can you speak to that for, for a couple of minutes and, and what your whole goals were and, and where, you're, where you're sitting in terms of what's been able to be solved today? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it, it's actually perfect timing. We just got back um, our sustainability report that we worked with Yale um, on. And so we actually have like solid feedback that we'll be putting out um, in the near future. So if you're interested in that at all, um, definitely make sure to um, sign up for our email list on our website, which Liza kindly put in the chat. Um, we'll be putting that out soon, but um, just to give a quick overview, you know, 3D printing is the reason that we can be environmentally friendly. Um, we already talked about the on-demand um, production process versus overproduction. Um, I touched on design for disassembly um, and really recyclability is a key element to that. So being able to uh, have a single piece, a single um, 3D printed unit that can be detached um, from the leather upper and recycled. Um, you know, if this was if this wasn't a single piece, we wouldn't be able to recycle it. Um, and so, um, design for disassembly and recyclability. And then one point that I think is really key and important that I haven't touched on is uh, water savings. Um, and that's such a that's a really big um, role that three D printing is playing. So, um, in uh, in traditional footwear making, um, your midsole and your outsole take up the majority of water usage. It's about um, three to 400 liters off the top of my head. Um, with 3D printing, um, that and that's the unit, the midsole, outsole, that's the unit that we're printing. Essentially, if you're comparing it to traditional footwear, um, it uses a fraction of that water. Um, and we actually end up saving 99% um, of water used um, using our 3D printed process paired with vapor smoothing, which is, um, you know, the post-processing uh, uh, process that um, creates this kind of shine um, and dark um, kind of like black shine effect. Um, with hydro dipping, it's a little bit less water savings, about 85%, but still, um, it's, it's a really powerful tool um, for the environment. So, um, so when it comes to the environment, those are the main impacts. Um, and when it comes to durability, um, we actually do put it through mechanical testing. So every time we develop a new construction, we put it through mechanical testing. And so we put the Georgia through um, 300 miles of mechanical testing and came out pretty much without a scratch. Um, so these shoes are gonna last. Um, they're gonna keep being comfortable because it's the digital mesh on top is not gonna collapse like your regular foam would. Um, and so I, and, and these are like the first to market, right? So we're just going to keep making them better, which is the exciting part. 
Yeah, that is great to hear. And I think uh, I love that you have some of that data handy in terms of water savings and just really other key aspects, because I think that is a huge focus for a lot of the people on the call is how how is this process and how are these technologies in fact affecting the environment? So um, appreciate you speaking to that. I know we have not made it through all the questions uh, and we are at time. Um, appreciate you both speaking with us today. It is fantastic to hear how you have taken these big ideas and actually brought them to market and done so at scale and, and made this technology assess accessible to the average consumer. Um, I would encourage everyone listening to uh, check out the Specialized and Helos websites and follow them on Instagram and, and continue to watch for new product developments um, and new product announcements. Uh, and, and again, thank you both very much for joining today. And, and hopefully we got to cover at least the main points on each of these products. I know, I know we have a ton more we could talk about. Thanks so much. It was great. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us. Um, I'm not a, I'm not really a biker, so I can't speak, but I'm sure the, the specialized seat is pretty amazing. But I am a wearer of Gaia shoes, and they are amazing, and I get lots of compliments, and they're very comfortable, and they do actually look like wood. So, um, yeah, my, my husband didn't believe that they were, and I said, they're, they're not wood. They just put them through a really cool finishing process. So, Thanks for uh, joining us and, and giving us some insight on, you know, how 3D printing is used in consumer goods. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.